Back in chapter 103, Koala tells Dragon that they apprehended in Dress Rosa weapons from the Flamingo smuggling scheme that contain a special metal called Kitetsu, with Ki meaning sake or alcohol in general, and Tetsu meaning iron. Koala says that this material can only be produced by a few countries. Other than that, we don't have a lot to go on to speculate on this mystery material. Wait a moment. Kitetsu. Where have I heard this name before? Hmm. Kitetsu. 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 Sandai Kitetsu. Sandai Kitetsu desu. Kono Zendai no Nigai Kitetsu wa Oazamono de. Sono mai no Shodai Kitetsu wa Saijo Oazamono ni chiste imasu.初代キテツをはじめ、キテツ一つの<笑><笑> Word is literally the same word. No way. Okay, okay. Hear me out, guys. I know this is gonna sound like a crazy, crazy idea, but what if the Kitetsu blades were named as such because they were made with Kitetsu? Guys, how does something like this just slip by? This community is so bizarrely high IQ most of the time. People are out there making theories based on obscure Sri Lanka myths. Yet somehow it doesn't seem to occur to anyone that these two things given the same name could possibly be connected. So here's probably why this went by unnoticed. Though they are both called Kitetsu, they were written with different kanji, giving them different meanings. The blades are called Demon Splitter combining the kanji for oni and demon and the kanji for piercing or penetrating. But even though they are cleverly written to mean different things, they are literally pronounced the exact same. So we know that the Kitetsu blades were produced by the Kitetsu school of blacksmithing from Wano. We also know that the Kitetsu ore only comes from a few countries. Now we know that Doflamingo was getting most of his weapons with Kaido as Kaido and Orochi had transformed one into a giant weapons factory and Kaido wanted the smiles produced by the Flamingo. We also know that Wano produced weapons with special characteristics. So yeah, it hardly seems like speculation to say that those weapons made from Kitetsu War came from Wano. But what is so special about this material and does it have anything to do with the Kitetsu blades all being cursed? So okay guys, here's another crazy idea, alright? What if there's a third meaning to Kitetsu. Guys, 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 we're all anime watchers here, so tell me, what is Ki? <laughs> it's Ki Iron, it's literally called Ki Iron. Oh man, this shit's gonna make me go gear fifth. Guys, this name Kitetsu has existed since chapter 97, released in 1999, almost 24 years ago. How guys, how? How isn't this just common knowledge in the fandom at this point? So for the NOR, Ki is this ancient East Asian concept of a vital energy that flows through a person's body, animating them. Now in ancient times, Ki was very tied to traditional Chinese medicine and martial arts. But the concept had such permeation through East Asian culture that the word still lives on to roughly mean your heart, your spirit, your mind, or your motivations, your feelings, your intention, your nature. You get the point. 
For example, in Japanese, you can combine ki with ha for hegemony or supremacy to form haki, meaning ambition. I think you see where I'm going with this, right? Ki was the central power system in Dragon Ball that, we all know, was a big inspiration to One Piece. So is Haki just a shameless copy of Ki? Is Oda like, no, 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 trust me guys, it is not Ki. It is absolutely not Ki. It is Haki, okay? It is a completely different thing, completely different. Well, no. Personally, I think there's quite a lot of thematic meaning to this. See, by making Haki the power system, I think One Piece is basically telling us that it is through ambition that your spirit materializes and changes the world around you. Now, back to Kitetsu. So if this material is called Ki Iron or Spirit Iron, then it's probably because it can interact with Ki, which means it should be able to interact with the manifestation of Ki, Haki. But how exactly and how does this tie to the Kitetsu Blades? So we actually receive a quite wonderful explanation of Cursed Swords during Zoro's flashback in Wano by Shimotsuki Kozaburu. Kozaburu tells us that blades exist to cut down people, that blacksmiths create the blades to ensure that they kill the maximum number of people. So when a cursed blade ends up being the death of its user, it's just doing its job a bit too well. So let's try to look at the Kitetsu school of crafting knowing about what Kitetsu truly is and applying Kozaburu's philosophy. The blacksmiths from the Kitetsu school used Kitetsu to forge their blades, knowing that Kitetsu has special properties of interacting with Haki. To make the blades even more deadly, they would imbue these blades with a killer Haki, a killer ambition, a killer disposition that the blade would be permanently able to store due to being made with Kitetsu. This would result in the blades having a unique killer disposition that could be so strong as to end up killing its own user, exactly as explained by Kozaburu. And now we go back to Zoro taming Sandai Kitetsu. Was this really just luck? Or did the sword's killer disposition submit to Zoro's stronger spirit? This looks like another one of those very early displays of Haki. Well, that certainly seems to be Kozaburu's take on it. As he puts it, a swordsman is one who tames the sword's wild nature and bends it to their will. And that name blades stay vigilant. They wait patiently to find a swordsman worthy of them. In fact, this was already told to us, way back then, when Sandai Kitetsu's salesman tells us that it is said that a sword chooses its wielder. And Zoro has probably always known this intuitively. Because even as a child, he was training with curse plates made by Kozaburu. So, are all curse plates made of Kitetsu? Uh, yeah, probably yes. The only confirmed curse sword, other than the three Kitetsu blades, is lost Kikoku, meaning Demon Well. Even though it is not literally named Kitetsu, it still follows the same naming pattern with the kanji Ki Foroni. But actually, there is another blade that might as well be confirmed to be cursed. So, about Kozaburu, doesn't it seem a bit suspicious that this guy specializes in crafting cursed plates and that it seems like he crafted the strongest of cursed plates, Enma. We are also told about Kozaburu from the very man who crafted Sandai Kitetsu. Well, doesn't it just seem logical that Kozaburu was also a member of the Kitetsu school of blacksmithing? And then we have his magnum opus, Enma, a blade that seems to unexplainably interact in weird ways with Haki. How convenient. What I'm saying is that Kozaburu was able to take the smithing of Kitetsu blades a step further to not only store Haki or spirit, but to channel it out, leading to the creation of Enma, a sword that channels out the user's Haki. This is also why the blade seems to store some of Odin's Haki has been shown to us multiple times, such as it going out of control due to the sound of Yuri playing the shamisen, which Odin loved. Now I know this thing about Emma holding Odin's Haki is a bit controversial, but let me just say this. Remember that the blades being built with killer Haki leads into them being much more difficult to tame, though some of Odin's Haki being built into the blade likely led to it becoming even more powerful by the same measure Odin's extremely powerful, wild and untamable disposition likely led this blade to become even more difficult to tame. It's as if Enma would only recognize a new owner if it can measure up to Odin, which is essentially what's told to us by Zoro during his fight with King. What else can Haki do? Well, through armament and through conqueror's coding, it can be used to make things extremely hard or near indestructible. 
So isn't it just incredibly convenient that Wano is also the source of these essentially indestructible stones that have this particular coloring and glossy look to them like they have been coated with Haki? Yeah, I'm saying that the Poneglyphs were also made with Kitetsu and then infused with an extremely powerful Haki, either armament or conquerors, to make them indestructible. So the one blacksmith of a Kitetsu blade that we get to meet is Tenguyama Hitetsu, who later on is revealed to be Oden's father, Kozuki Tsukiyaki. The blacksmith of Shodai Kitetsu is never revealed, but the blacksmith of Nidai Kitetsu is revealed to be Kotetsu. Kotetsu, much like the similar Hitetsu, is likely a fake name. So what will be the true name of this blacksmith? Well, probably Kozuki something, because Kotetsu is revealed to be an ancestor of Tsukiyaki and of the modern Kozuki family. Now, why would the Kozuki family specifically be so heavily involved with the Kitetsu school of blacksmithing? Well, of course they would, because the Kozuki were the ones who crafted the Poneglyphs, and if they made the Poneglyphs out of Kitetsu, then creating the Kitetsu blades was merely applying the knowledge they already had of working with Kitetsu to bladesmithing. There are about a hundred different theories about what Bink Sake represents, so I'll just add mine to the list. So remember, Kitetsu is translated to liquor iron, alcohol iron, or sake iron because of the double meaning of ki, which can also mean sake or alcohol in general, or than just meaning spirit. Funnily, this double meaning also exists in English, kinda. Spirit also can mean an alcoholic beverage. Anyways, what I'm saying here is that sake in Bing sake could mean Bing sake iron, Bing skitetsu, or Bing spirit. Specifically, that it could be about delivery of the poneglyphs. So according to Robin, the Skypea poneglyph says, we are the ones who spin the tale of history in harmony with the sound of the grand belfry. The word Robin uses is tsumugu, a verb meaning to spin, as in with a spindle to make yarn from wool, or to spin as in telling a story. In Bing Sake we have the line, Sayonara Minato Tsumugi no Sato Yo, farewell to everybody, to the spinning village. Notice how the same verb is used here, Tsumugi, in this case conjugated obviously, so the author of the song is saying goodbye to the village where they spin the tale of history, the village of the people who made the poneglyphs, therefore Wano. Following it says, let's all sing with the dawn as the ship sets sail. Dawn of course having the double meaning in Japanese of dawn, as with Luffy's recent moves in Gear 5th. The rest of the song I think we're all very familiar with. They sing about saying goodbye to everybody, how they will never meet again, and then sail into the ends of the seas. Which was the fate of the people who delivered the poneglyphs at the end of the void century, no? Sailing to the end of the seas to deliver the poneglyphs in one final voyage before the void century is erased from history, while still saying that if you hold on, eventually the dawn will come. And ending with the line, our never ending, ever wondering, traveling laugh tale. Binks, probably the first joy boy, is probably the one who left behind the message in the Poneglyphs, as when finding out the true history in Laftel, Roger talks as if speaking directly to Joy Boy, saying it was Joy Boy still. Binks Sake could refer to the liquor iron or to Binks spirit, which potentially was the haki that was used to forge the Poneglyphs. One is the source of yet another unbreakable stone, Kairoseki, the sea prism stone that emanates the energy of the sea. So do I need to spell it out this time? Yeah, Kairoseki is also made with Kitetsu. So in Skypiea we are told by Pagaya that the island clouds and sea clouds from Skypiea are made from a substance called pyrobloin and that the same substance is what Kairoseki is made from. So now how in Skypiea the names for certain things can be different than the names that they have in the blue sea, like earth is called Verth. Yeah, I'm saying Pyrobloin is just another name for Kitetsuar. So Pagaya says that Pyrobloin comes from volcanoes, with pyro meaning fire coming from the Greek pyr, which I guess is an appropriate name for a substance that comes from volcanoes. Now, what is one of the most prominent landmarks in Wano? Oh yeah, it's the huge volcano in the middle of it. We know that below Wano, there's a huge magma chamber. I mean, we see Kaido and Big Mom being thrust into it and a volcanic eruption being caused by it. So, when we see the Kozuki crafting the Poneglyphs, we see them surrounded by billowing, fiery smoke, like the one coming from a volcano, which is logical if the material that they used came from the volcano or from these lava chambers. Now if you've watched some of my other videos, you should know that I tend to spend a lot of time talking about inspirations from mythology that Oda uses to craft his story. So what could be the inspiration here 
for this whole Kitetsu thing. While throughout many different religions in various parts of the world, the underworld is described as the place where the spirit of the dead go to. You know, the Christian and Muslim hell, the Greek Hades, the Egyptian Duat, the Hindu Naraka, the Zoroastrian Duzak, the Sumerian Kur, the Taoist Diyu, etc. So if the underworld is where the spirits of the dead are stored, I guess it makes sense that this material with the ability of storing spirit would come from the underworld. So if this material is in the underworld and it comes from volcanoes, then it is in, well, quite obviously, the magma. So does this mean that the magma in the One Piece world could have these properties of Kitetsu, of storing or channeling spirit or haki? Well, that would be rather convenient, right? Considering that one of our major antagonists, Akainu, has the magma fruit. Yeah, if Pyroboim is Kitetsu and Kitetsu has his properties of storing and channeling haki, then Akainu's fruit will probably turn out to be even more powerful than we've seen so far. Having some properties of storing and channeling Haki probably only accessible with an awakening, I would imagine. Hell, it could be that this magma could even be storing someone's spirit. Okay, so if the Poneglyphs were turned indestructible by combining Kitetsu with Haki, then what about Kaido Seki? Well, it's safe to hold the energy of the sea. Is the energy of the sea just someone's Haki? I want you to think about this for a second. Other than the powers of the Yami Yami no Mi, which were already explained to us as sucking the devil out of the user, only two other things that we've seen can negate devil fruit abilities. Haki and the energy of the sea. Now there's a little thing in logic called Occam's Razor, where we try to look for explanation for phenomena that have the smallest possible set of elements, which we would achieve here by the energy of the sea and Haki being one and the same. Now the way the energy of the sea behaves is that it targets devil fruit users and weakens them to the point where they cannot move and makes them pass out. Now have we seen a form of Haki that behaves similarly to this? Yeah, I'm saying not only the energy of the sea is Haki, it is Conqueror's Haki. But if it's just Conqueror's Haki, why does it only affect Devil Fruit users? Well, as we know, Conqueror's Haki can be targeted at particular individuals. It is targeted specifically at Devil Fruit users because, as Vegapunk says, Devil Fruit users are hated by Mother Nature, the sea itself. Which is why the sea's energy has since the beginning of the series been referred to as the sea's hatred, with sea being umi in Japanese. The sea's hatred is just imu's hatred. Yeah, I'm saying imu coded the entirety of the world's waters with conquerors haki. Now, is something like this even possible? The sea is not filled with Kitetsu, so even if Imu did coat the waters with Conqueror's Haki, how can it be permanently coated? Even water that is at the other side of the world and completely disconnected from Imu. Well, she could do it if she has a water devil fruit. Now, if you've watched any of my previous videos, you should know that, yes, I buy into the theories that Imu is a three-eyed woman, immortal, and has the power to control water, likely a water Logia. Say theories line up extremely well with my own. Now, try to remember Luffy's fight against Katakuri. When using block mochi, which is basically mochi infused with haki, Katakuri was able to spawn the mochi through his awakening, already coated in haki, even when it was mid-air completely disconnected from his body. It seems that if you have a devil fruit of a certain element or substance, then you can infuse that substance with your haki and maintain it infused, even if you have no direct physical connection to it. So if Imu has a water power, then yes, Imu should be able to coat all water with Conqueror's Haki and maintain it coated. Now in previous videos I also talked about banana type myths, a type of myth common in East Asian folklore where the banana represents mortality, finiteness or short-lived and the stone represents immortality, eternity or long life. And that in chapter 877, where the word play banana, Pedro, the main color like a ripe banana, and who was fastly rotting away by having had 50 years of his life been stolen, dies at the young age of 32. So if Imu is immortal, Imu should represent the stone. Chapter 1010 has the word play to iwa, meaning if you combine chapter 177 with 1010, you have banana to iwa, 
banana and stone. Chapter 1010 though also has the wordplay hito wata meaning person water or personified water so it likely contains some kind of hint about an immortal stone who is also water personified obviously imu right and if you look at the cover of chapter 1010 oh boy would you look at that pudding the three-eyed woman with the power to change people's memories who as i've addressed in the past contains a lot of foreshadowing to imu so jackpots but what was chapter 1010 about again oh yeah it's the chapter named conquer zaki in the volume named conquer zaki and in it is when we learn about conquer zaki coding if you wanted to know how powerful i think imu is well there you have it i think imu is in an entirely different plane of existence from anyone else you've seen in the series thus far as i said in a previous video i think imu has the strongest conquer zaki of them all Conquer Zaki is so advanced that she is able to use it to erase the memories of others. So powerful that she was able to coat the entirety of the world's waters with it. Imu is quite simply that bitch. You with that bitch. I want you to think about this for a second. Every single time that we saw Luffy fall into the water and almost draw, that was actually Imu defeating Luffy with Conquer Zaki. The type of defeat relegated to fodder, with Imu probably not even knowing that Luffy had fallen into the sea. It's not just that in those scenes Luffy is being defeated by Imu, it's like Luffy is pirate number 56,110 in the Fishman Plaza when Luffy makes 50,000 guys pass out. Or when another Yonko, Big Mom, fell into the sea and passed out during Act 2 of Wano. Technically that was also Imu negating Big Mom. And remember I say that Imu is able to use Conquer Zaki to erase the memories of others? What happens to Big Mom when she passes out? Oh yeah, she loses her memories. A brilliant little piece of foreshadowing, isn't it? Even if the scene is, well, uh, controversial in the fandom. Who am I? The fact that Imu has imbued Haki into the water itself is why all water in the world, irrespective if it's salty seawater or not, carries this energy of the sea and acts as a weakness to devil fruit users. Even when the water evaporates, Imo's haki remains bounded to it. Even when it condenses back and downpours as rain, it remains imbued with Imo's haki. I like a beautiful young lady right now, but if I'm in Fox Hills Mall, I see some niggas trying to trip. You know what I mean? Ain't no thing oh, for me to come out with the motherfucking verse, you know what I'm saying? I'm still with that motherfucking life. The people of Wano learned that by submerging Kitetsu in water, they were able to store in it the energy of the sea itself, which is just Imu's Haki. Imu's Haki being stored into the Kitetsu would make it indestructible like the Poneglyphs and weaken Devil Fruit users. As we saw, the craftsmen of Wano were able to create Kaidoseki with different strengths which is basically of matter of how much of Imu's Haki is concentrated in a given piece of Kairoseki. The water of the world itself probably is not imbued with the Haki with a very high concentration, which is why devil fruit users need to be sufficiently submerged in the water before they become affected by it. The Kitetsu is able to store the Haki at a much higher concentration, leading to Kairoseki having the same effect as the sea, but seemingly much stronger, where touching only a small piece of it is already enough to weaken a devil fruit user. But then we have to ask, why are devil fruit users not affected by water that is inside of their own bodies? Well remember, Haki is the manifestation of Ki, and Ki flows through a person's body. Much like the haki from two different people clash instead of overlapping, Imu's haki, especially in its low concentration form that is found in the water, clashes with a person's own spirit, their own ki, and thus is unable to enter their body. But then you have to wonder, if Imu's haki is able to maintain itself infused into the water even when it changes phases from liquid to vapor, shouldn't it also be in ice? How come then that Kuzan and Monet are even able to use their powers? Well remember, Imu is able to maintain all of the water in the world infused with her conqueror's haki by using her water powers. When Kuzan or Monet use their powers to control ice or snow, that ice or snow is then under the control of their devil fruits, no longer under Imu's control. Thus Imu's Haki is unable to maintain itself infused in it. But how can they even use their devil fruit powers in the water if Haki negates devil fruit powers? Well remember, it has to be strong enough Haki, and the Haki imbued in the water is at a low concentration. Finally, I want you to think about this. Luffy as a character is written as someone who personifies freedom, someone whose dream is to be the freest person in the world. 
But in One Piece, where the sea is often used to represent freedom, how can a seaman truly be free if he can't even swim? As a pirate, someone living in the high seas, the sea itself oppresses him. Does this seem fitting for the man who, as he puts it, wants to become the ruler of the seas? Isn't this a bit contradictory? Because the build-up is all for so that when Luffy achieves his dream and becomes the freest person in the world, when the seas have finally been freed from this oppressive will, as the ultimate representation of the freedom that Luffy has achieved, we will see him in the last chapter jump into the sea and swim. So back to Skypea and Pyroblime. The way it's explained by Pagaya is that Pyroblime is dispersed into the air as Kakushitsu no Ryushi. Angle particles? Corneous particles? Horny particles? What? Anyways, it's dispersed into the air as tiny particles. It then absorbs moisture from the atmosphere, forming island and sea clouds. So, a little bit of cloud formation. The air can hold a certain amount of water dispersed as vapor, up to a maximum point called the saturation point. The higher the air temperature, the higher the saturation point, thus the more water vapor it can hold, which is why the hotter it gets, the quicker the water evaporates. When the air reaches the saturation point, normally by being cooled, and thus having its saturation point lowered, the vapor will begin to condense into liquid water. And the problem is that, statistically, it's extremely unlikely for the water molecules going all sorts of different directions in the air to come together at any particular point to form a water droplet, which is why pure air can sometimes hold water vapor past even the saturation point. What tends to happen instead is that the water will condense on a solid surface. In the case of cloud formation, it condenses on tiny particles floating in the air, like dust, bacteria, salt crystals from the sea spray of crashing waves, and even volcanic ashes. Now, why am I nerding out about clouds, you ask? Like, why would this stuff have any correlation to One Piece? There's no way Oda would know any of this stuff, right? Except, this is the whole basis for the idea of cloud seeding. A technique to artificially create clouds and rain by dispersing tiny particles into the air, which is exactly what dense powder was. You know, the thing that basically caused the entire Alabasta conflict. Actually, it is described as acting by a specific process of cloud seeding called ice nucleation, and was confirmed by Oda to be based on the ice nucleating silver iodide. So yeah, Oda actually did know about all this nerd stuff about cloud formation. So, let's apply what we know from this theory to cloud formation and you will see how it will all make sense. The Kitetsu particles are dispersed into the air much like regular volcanic ashes. When mixing with air supersaturated with water, these particles act as cloud seeds. When the water condenses on the Kitetsu particles, they absorb Imus Haki that is stored in it. When they do so, they harden and bind together, resulting in a solidified cloud. The higher the concentration of Kitetsu particles in the air, the higher the concentration of the bones, and the higher the strength of those bones due to the particles being closer together. At a low concentration, the bones are enough to give the cloud surface tension and to keep it at near constant volume, instead of expanding outwards and mixing with the air like a gas would, but not enough for the cloud to keep a constant shape beyond microscopic lengths, which you know is exactly the case for a liquid only at the molecular level. Thus why sea clouds behave like a liquid. At a higher concentration, the bony strength is enough to keep the cloud solid with a constant shape, thus resulting in island clouds. Increasing the concentration further increases the stiffness and hardness of the cloud, like with the iron clouds. In the limit case where the particles would be packed so close together as to have no space between them, you have simply a solid piece of Kitetsu infused with Imus Haki, which is just Kairoseki, which we know is as hard as diamond. And as stated by Pagaya, they are able to create clouds with intermediate characteristics by manipulating their density. Much like we're introduced to Kitetsu with a sword, Sandai Kitetsu, we see iron clouds being used as a sword. And this parallel between Zoro holding Sandai Kitetsu in his left hand and Om holding his iron cloud sword also with his left hand. Funny that they turn out to be made out of the same material. The fact that this material is hardened by Haki is why it's able to be so strong as to bind together and remain solid, despite being as light as air. Now here's the thing, if the sea's energy is Imus Haki, then theoretically it shouldn't be this unavoidable, unbeatable law of the world, right? 
someone with sufficiently advanced haki of their own, especially someone with high enough conqueror's haki, should in theory be able to resist Imu's haki even while in the sea. And actually all the training that Luffy did while using the shackles of low strength Kairoseki seemed almost like a setup for this, right? Almost as if training with training wheels and being able to resist the energy of the sea seemed like precisely the power that Luffy would need to have if he is really to defeat the world government. Well, what if I told you that he is set to learn that ability and from the perfect teacher at that. Now, other than Imu, I guess, if I would ask you, who do you think has the strongest conqueror's Aki of anyone alive in the verse right now? Who would come to your mind? Well, I know who would come to mind. Of course, Red Hair Shanks, the man from whom we see in the craziest feats of Conqueror's Aki, able to damage the environment itself and make members of the Whitebeard Pirates pass out by just slightly pouring out some of it, able to send an immense blast of Conqueror's Aki at least half an island away that is strong enough to scare even an admiral, able to defeat a pirate worth 3 billion berries and his vice captain with a single Conqueror's Haki infused attack and the perfect person narratively to teach Luffy this skill. The very man who put Luffy on this journey to begin with gave him his devil fruit, who first warned him of his weakness to water, who first saved him from drowning, and was now waiting for him at Elbeth, probably our last big stop before Laftail itself, where he can teach him how to save himself. But you might ask, why would Shinx need to resist the energy of the sea? Shinx doesn't have a devil fruit. Is that right? Shanks has never been confirmed to not have a devil fruit. It is assumed that he doesn't have one because of this scene where he swims to save Luffy, but as we've established, if someone was able to resist Timu's haki to the point of being able to swim, even if having a devil fruit, that would probably be Shanks. But in that case, even if Shanks is able to resist it enough to swim, he would probably be still severely weakened by it, which is how he could have his arm eaten by a father seeking the Luffy one shots in chapter one. Has the scene ever made any sense to you? How can the Shanks that as we know now had already had his legendary duels with Mihawk lose his arm to such a weak creature? Well, maybe now the scene makes a bit more sense to you. And what else Shanks having a devil fruit would help solve? The whole Shanks versus Mihawk situation? Boy, this is um, probably a mistake here. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna enter into stupid power scale debate. So based on general portrayal and stupid hints, like for example, Oda making Shanks exactly one centimeter taller than Mihawk, the same way he made Zoro exactly one centimeter taller than Sanji or King exactly one centimeter taller than Queen. Those things lead me to believe that Shanks is supposed to be stronger than Mihawk. At the same time, as for actual power scaling arguments, I, I gotta say, the arguments for Shanks being stronger are generally nonsense. You know, if Shanks really is primarily a swordsman, then no, he shouldn't be stronger than Mihawk if the title World's Strongest Swordsman is supposed to mean anything, right? And yeah, guys, the Hockey Man stuff, it, it, it's bullshit. Okay? It, it's bullshit. There's no other way to put it. For Shanks to be stronger than Mihawk, then his main fighting style must be something significantly different in swordsmanship. To me, it seems like Oda is setting up for this to be the case, where a person can be a sword wielder but not be primarily a swordsman. The greatest example is Zoro's fight against King, where Zoro brings up multiple times that King is not a true swordsman. And notice he brings this up specifically because of King's use of his devil fruit powers. So you know what would be a non-bullshit way for Shanks to actually be stronger than Mihawk but not take his title of the world's strongest swordsman? If, when going all out, Shanks makes ample use of a devil fruit power in ways that have nothing to do with swordsmanship. But what is this devil fruit? What really is the true power of red hair Shanks? Yeah, I have no idea. Anyways guys, next video of this series I'll go deep into elemental powers, the breath of all things and the voice of all things. So um, subscribe maybe if you don't want to miss that. For this video that's it. Ciao. Se por acaso você se rendesse, o nosso caso de amor seria demais. Se nessas idas e vindas você se envolvesse, devolver.